and welcome to the Tension Podcast. I'm your host, Donna DuPont, with the Archipelago of Design. Today's podcast is part of a series on the power of play and serious games. Joining me today is Cassie Miedema. She is a senior foresight and design researcher at the Archipelago of Design. Cassie is passionate about resilience and transformative culture change. Welcome, Cassie. So to kick us off, tell us about the work you do at AOD and your unique design story. Thanks, Donna. Um, I'm working on several projects at AOD right now. Um, I recently completed the project Safeguarding the Future. It's a strategic foresight handbook for national security and defense professionals, and it's publicly available on the AOD website if anyone's interested. And I'm also currently working on uh, a climate change and security workshop toolkit and Project Inner Alliance, which is a transformative game that is designed to increase inclusivity and readiness within defense and security teams. Uh, My design story starts with uh, architecture, which is what I studied before doing what I do now. Um, Architecture gave me lots of different design skills. Buildings are about understanding and integrating interrelated components and complexity and coordination, which really gave me a foundation in systems thinking. Uh, But they're also about experiences and how people experience spaces and buildings, which I think give me a human-centered approach to design. Um, And the enduring nature of architecture inherently gave me a resilience framing when understanding how, how I design. And I have a passion for city building, urban design. I also do urban agriculture research, um, which are all, in my opinion, ways to contribute to the betterment of communities, which is really what drove my passion and interest in having a social impact. Uh, So transitioning from architecture, I learned all of those great skills, but uh, switching to uh, research in defense and security was really a 180 career choice for me. Um, But in hindsight, I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, I was a little bit disillusioned with architecture and the lack of efficacy and agency I could have, and I wasn't having the social impact that I wanted to have. Um, so I went back to school. I studied strategic foresight and innovation at the Ontario College of Art and Design in Toronto. That's where I met uh, Professor Michele Mastroni, and that's how I started getting involved with AOD. Um, and at OCAD, I learned all these skills around ethnographic research methods, and I think that's what really drew me to the work that AOD does. Um, That's really built into the way that we do projects um, and our co-design approach, which I'll talk more about later. That's wonderful. Thank you, Cassie, for sharing a bit of your background. It's a really unique story because you come from architecture. It's a very different world. And I love how you were talking about just you're wanting to have more social impact in the work that you do and in the types of projects you're involved with and how important that human center element is. I think that's um, so important in today's world. Sometimes we forget about people as part of the systems that we're all trying to change and transform. So how did you get involved in the serious game side of the work that you do? Well, um, I've always been a nerd and a gamer. (laughs) Um, So I've always had, I've always gamed on um, different systems, Xbox, GameCube. I have a Switch now. I've tried them all. PlayStation, Nintendo 64. Uh, But now I'm mostly a computer gamer. Um, But I also enjoy playing board games, which, is related to the work that we do at EOD as well. Um, so you have a natural passion and love for games, which is absolutely. wonderful and makes a lot of sense. 
makes a lot of sense. So for our audience who may not be familiar with the world of serious games, um, what are serious games? Yeah, serious games are a subset, I would say, of social impact games. Um, and last uh, last summer, I went to the Games for Change conference, which really opened up my eyes to the wide world of social impact games and serious games. Um, their their conference mandates are a really interesting one. They they want to change the perception of gaming from games are bad and violent to games have the power to have a po positive social message. Um, that really resonated with me and, and the type of work that I enjoy doing. Social impact games are games designed with instrumentalized goals. It's an umbrella term that encompasses games that have learning goals or games that are designed for behavior change. And it also includes and overlaps with serious games. Um, and they're games that go beyond just mere entertainment value. That's excellent. Uh, I, I've heard of the Games for Change conference, and I was fascinated when I first learned about that conference. I haven't had the opportunity to attend uh, um, a conference myself, but I can only imagine how inspiring it would be to learn from so many different people that are using games um, in a very different way, as you were saying, as a tool to help shape positive outcomes, um, you know, social outcomes, and for learning and behavior change. I think those are all really powerful uses of, of games. And perhaps a lot of people are not aware that those are some of the goals attached to these types of games. So it sounds like these games can be influential. H how can they influence um, a player, you know, when they're exposed to these games? What can someone expect when they're engaging or interacting with a game that's around social impact? Yeah, there's lots of different ways that uh, impact games, social impact games, serious games can influence uh, change in a player. Um, they can rely on mechanics that can be applied to influence or inspire a change in players. There's also the, uh, theory, nudge theory, which I'm not an expert on, but it's, they call them nudges or activations, uh, to influence players' choices. Uh, one of my favorite examples of nudge theory is the piano stairs in a subway station in Stockholm. And so they made these stairs interactive and musical and encouraged users to choose the stairs over uh, riding the escalator. Um, and there's a blog actually that I wrote on my experience at Games for Change and goes into nudge theory a bit more and more examples of where more examples of nudge theory uh, on the AOD website, which I'm sure we'll link in the description of this podcast. Yeah, definitely. We can link to that that article. Thank you for sharing that. And nudge theory is interesting because it's part of the world of design and, and belongs to behavioral science, behavioral insights type methods, which may people may not be aware of. So thank you for sharing that. Really interesting. So I understand you're working on uh, a project called um, Inner Alliance. It's a game project. Um, so Tell us about what this this game is all about. Yeah, Project Inner Alliance is currently under development in partnership with Wiro Creative. Um, and it's a part of the suite of AOD's games that are um, designed to accelerate cultural evolution. That's, I would say, the broad category that it falls under. Um, specifically, Project Inner Alliance aims to promote transformation of beliefs and behaviors by exploring team dynamics and cohesion and is really targeted at increasing inclusivity. Uh, the premise of the game is the, that the team plays as a commander of a humanitarian aid and disaster relief unit. And the team is deployed to respond to dev the devastating effects of floods. And their objective is to rescue people, provide critical aid, go on all kinds of different missions, um, and it alternates between two different styles of play. So there's the squad-based tactical part of the game where you're fighting against the floods, you're rescuing people, 
And then there's the branching narrative dialogue where the players can build that team cohesion with their teammates, which both pieces of the game kind of influence one another. Um, and through things like mechanics and limited command, we also are exploring like a trust meter or belonging meter. Um, players learn the importance of increasing inclusivity and readiness in their teams, both in the game and hopefully that also translates for them to real life. That's great. I love that. It's um very, very different type of game. I don't think I've ever played a game quite like that where it's um it's really focusing on the cultural side and and building trust. And you mentioned in inclusivity as well and that sense of belonging. I think that's that's really powerful. Can you tell us a bit more about why why inclusivity and belonging and trust our key elements and um, goals around this game? Yeah, um, it all started with a workshop that we held in September, 2023. Um, one of the main themes that came out of that workshop, the participants really thought there was a need for a game that addressed inclusivity. Um, and we see this in com like coming out in all kinds of other signals, uh, in terms of CAF recruitment targets, they want to increase the percentage of women in the CAF from 16% to 25% by 2026. I think that's a pretty progressive and um, ambitious goal for the CAF. Uh, but also there's low recruitment. They want to increase other minority groups, in increase recruitment with other minority groups within the CAF. And of course, there's things like the Arbor Report and public scandals going on about sexual misconduct um, and the need for cultural evolution and modernization within the CAF. So that's a really powerful why in terms of to focus this type of game. And um, I think what I find quite fascinating is that you are getting a transformation of beliefs and behaviors. It's very much at the mental model side of design. And, um, and that's, that's really interesting because it all starts, transformation starts with how we, our beliefs, our stories, the way we see the world. That's, uh, that's quite powerful. So I also, um, am curious, you chose, um, uh, the topic, the theme for the game to focus also on humanitarian aid and disaster relief. Why was this theme chosen um, as part of this game? Yeah, there's games that have, other games that have inspired the design of this game, like XCOM 2 and other tactical games. Um, but I think we kind of wanted to stay away from the violence and the the focus on fighting and tactical combat. So we chose humanitarian aid and disaster relief as a theme so that the environment could be the enemy instead. Uh, so players are really forced to use their critical thinking and strategic planning skills to overcome the environmental challenges that the game poses for them. Um, and I think that facing environmental obstacles can also inspire players to come up with creative solutions, enhancing their ability to think outside the box and work together. And it really shifts the focus from that character-based combat, which we see so often in games, um, to environmental challenges and, and collaboration and solving problems together. And it also increases awareness of these real-world challenges, all flooding, f forest fires, all these challenges exacerbated by climate change that are just becoming more and more prevalent. And I think it fits really nicely with the social impact goal of our game. It creates, it really creates a more inclusive gameplay environment um, and really puts the focus on how you build cohesion within your team to solve, the, solve these uh, problems together. That makes a lot of sense. And uh, I really uh, thank you for explaining that, um, that, that 
background thinking and why disaster relief and humanitarian aid, because you're right, today's context, we are, in today's world, we are seeing increasingly, increasing number of disasters. And it requires unprecedented collaboration and cooperation and working across teams um, at different levels. So I think that, um, I think that makes a lot of sense in terms of bringing the two themes and project design goals for this game together. It makes a lot of sense. I understand Project Inner Alliance is co-designed. What does co-design mean and why is it important? Co-design is a type of participatory design. It's a collaborative approach where we design with our project community and the end users, and they're integral to the process. This is important, I think, because it encourages a diversity of participants contributing to the development process, and it ensures that the end product will resonate with our target audience. AOD really believes in the power of co-design, especially with transformative games. And I think it really aligns with our social impact goal of inclusivity and brings those values of diversity to the development of the project. Yeah, that's great. I think that co-design, the opportunity to be involved early on in the development of the process, the thinking is very powerful um, to have that diversity of thought and ideas contribute in, I think speaks to, um, it speaks to the importance of, of, as you said, being inclusive, participatory, not just in the product and in the delivery, but in the all stages of the process, including how, how the concept was developed and, and um, produced. So I think that's wonderful. What stage are you at in the de- co-design process of this game? So for the series games, conference, we are hoping to have two demo levels completed uh, in prototype phase. And then we are also looking at developing more levels for the game beyond that and also digitizing the game. It is the, from the inception of the project, it was meant to be a video game played by one person. Um, But in the prototype phase, we are experimenting with paper prototypes, tabletop prototypes, and and a hybrid between uh, digital and paper. We're using Twine for the dialogue part of the project. Excellent. So it'll be available in, in different formats um, and different ways to engage, right, with with the, the final product. Are there opportunities um, to still get involved if, if our audience is interested in being part of the co-design process? Um, how can they learn more and get involved? Yeah, we are about to organize a series of focus groups. Um, so we're looking for experts and collaborators on humanitarian aid, disaster relief, emergency management. Uh, we're also looking to organize one of those focus groups on behavior change, metrics, how to measure that within the game, how to measure impact. If anyone is interested in getting involved, uh, they can email me at cassie at aodnetwork.ca. Uh, we also hold project community meetings and playtesting sessions, so there's many ways for people to get involved. If you're looking to learn more about the project, we're in the process of revamping our project page um, uh, on the AOD website. And there will be, hopefully by the time that this podcast is released, a project page for this project so you can learn more. Wonderful. Thank you, Cassie, for sharing all that information. We will also post those um, some links in the show notes of this podcast for our audience to, to access. So before we wrap up our podcast, do you have any final thoughts you want to share on Project Inner Alliance and the next steps in your co-design process? I think it's um, important that if anyone wants to get involved in the project, you don't have to be an expert. We are looking for experts for some of the focus groups, but our co-design approach is really 
you come to a workshop, you help us design a game, you are a game designer just by nature of being involved in the process. So there's no previous experience required. Um, I think that everyone has ideas and insights to contribute to these types of projects. So I encourage anyone who's interested in the game to reach out, get involved. Um, just send us an email. Thank you, Cassie. Um, really appreciate that. Uh, and you're right, for, for some of us who've never been involved in the process of designing a, ga a game, it can sound very intimidating. So thank you for that invitation and that warm welcome. And also thank you so much for taking the time today to share your knowledge um, and, and this new project uh, that AOD is designing um, called Project Inner Alliance with us. We're excited about the idea of, um, of this project and I can't wait to have you back to, um, to hear more about the design of this and eventually the official launch, um, hopefully next year. Thank you, Donna. It's been a pleasure being on the podcast. Thank you, Cassie.